Our reading today is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The word of the Lord. Hey, good morning. If we could actually, there are quite a few people standing. Uh, everyone's favorite part. Can everybody scoop in, scoot into the middle, please, just so we could create a bit more space? Um, thank you. See, if you, if, if you felt like, hey, you know, I don't know anybody at this church, now you're going to know somebody. Uh, sit nice and close. Well, we are uh, we're, we're actually fi finishing up our series today, uh, The New King is Here. And during this series, we've talked about uh, some of the, the larger themes of the season, some of the characters of the season. And I think some of the characters, the biblical characters we talk about in the Nativity story are, are the very characters we see in uh, Nativity scenes or in, in pageants. Now, I know that uh, our family, uh, for me as a little kid growing up, we had... Uh, every December, kind of that tradition, we'd go in the basement, we'd take out the box of all the Christmas stuff, and we had a uh, nativity scene of our own. And it was really nice. It kind of signaled the beginning of a season. Uh, it made you think about the story. This is actually our nativity scene that we have in our home today. Uh, it's a, so it's a tradition that we continue. And our top priority now, though, with our nativity scene is not so much the look, but the sturdiness. Uh, because if you notice, those are very rotund, solid pieces of wood because our daughter likes to help the characters fly. Uh, and so the nativity set for us is basically a bunch of biblical uh, dangerous projectiles at this point. But maybe some of us have nativity scenes in our home as well, or maybe we had them uh, growing up. And there really are so many kinds. Uh, and, I, and actually an acquaintance of mine stumbled on this viral idea probably now about seven or eight years ago, uh, that got a lot of traffic online. And he became fascinated by the most unusual, obscure nativity uh, sets that you could find. And so he has, his current list today is the top 77. I just want to show a few of these. Uh, the first one is an Irish nativity set. Uh, so they come bearing the gifts of gold and Guinness. Um, <laughs> Uh, the second one, there was a guy who didn't really like the Christmas season, and so he created a, a, ne a negativity scene. Um, <laughs> this third one, it's a lot to deal with. It's a meat nativity scene. Just, it's just not right. Um, and then we I'll keep going. We, someone went ultra minimalist, so minimalist nativity scene. Uh, and then finally... Uh, we have the millennial hipster nativity scene. Uh, but here, here's the thing, though. Here's the, the thing, though. As, as wild as these seem, 
these nativity scenes aren't that much more far-fetched than some of the traditional ones we have. Because most of the nativity scenes that we have today, including the one that's in our home, it has lots of conflicts with the story that's actually told in the Bible. For example, just a a few examples here. Uh, When we read they were in, um, there was no room for them at the inn, uh, the English word, we think usually that that means kind of the ancient equivalent of the Holiday Inn was full. Right, like, a, like first century hotel. But actually, it was something more like probably like a guest room in someone's house, maybe even like a kind of like a basement or like a cave type situation. Here's another thing, and this is kind of a Debbie Downer moment, but there's no actual mention of animals. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's pray. Let's pray. Uh, <laughs> Now, there's no mention of animals. It's kind of a guess or conjecture because we talk about a manger. Um, or think of even the magi or the, the wise men. It never says that there are three of them. We assume there are three because there are three gifts. And we, well, one person must bring one gift, right? Is there must be three. In fact, Christian tradition even gave them names of Melchior, Casper, and Balthazar. Now, those are clearly great names, Uh, but there's actually no evidence for any of that. Another thing, there was a timing issue as well. It's very unlikely that the shepherds and that the wise men were actually there at the same time. In fact, it's very possible that the wise men or the magi didn't come until many, many months after Jesus' birth. And last but not least, most of our nativity scenes out there show Jesus and his family of apparently being of Swedish descent. Uh, (laughs) Definitely not right. And so again, there is nothing against nativity scenes, but something can get lost in the picture that we often uh, see and the historical reality of that time. Because it's not just about who's in the picture, but who's not in the picture. There's a major character who never makes the nativity set, despite his central role in the plot, and that is Herod. He's the anti-Advent character. He's the anti-hero. We don't want to talk about him. We don't want to remember him. And he really disrupts the idyllic picture of the season, but he's really, really important. The text uh, begins this way. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. That's how it begins. That's not a throwaway line. That's not uh, Matthew trying to up his word count a little bit. Right? It's saying this isn't just a a a once-upon-a-time story. This is actually a real place with real political and historical dynamics at work. And so this morning, what we're going to do is actually probably a little bit different than what we've done in this series. I want to spend a good amount of time, probably the bulk of the time, looking at King Herod um, so that we can better appreciate the kingdom of Jesus, uh, to feel the real weight of Jesus and and his kingdom. And, And I believe we can get some hope Uh, in this season and all of that. Now, we might uh, know Herod from a few mentions in the Gospels. He gets a few mentions, but the thing we miss today is just how big of a figure he really was. So who's Herod? Well, a little bit about his personality first. Uh, Herod was the kind of guy who made a carefully crafted crafted image of himself as one steeped in education and Greco-Roman refinement. He was friends with all the people in high places. He would shower the people he wanted to, who he wanted to gain esteem from. Uh, he would give them gifts, and he would invite them to his awesome parties and palaces, and he studied philosophy and rhetoric and history, and he was always trying to impress. He fancied himself as a sophisticated gentleman. Now, though he thought of himself as a very enlightened man, uh, the writers of the New Testament saw him as a ruthless, crazed tyrant. For example, he tortured and killed family members, servants, some of his guards. Uh, In one particular outburst, he ordered the execution of the woman he loved the most, his second wife, because he just had a, a guess that maybe she was cheating on him. Herod's eldest son and heir apparent convinced Herod that his two other sons were trying to overthrow him, and so he has those two sons uh, executed. Then he finds out that that initial first son was planning to poison him, and so he rises out of his bed just five days before his own death to order his son's murder. Now, the emperor uh, Augustus supposedly said that it's better to be one of Herod's pigs than one of his sons. 
Now, here, here's another example, and this plan actually did not come to fruition, uh, but before Herod's death, when he knew that kind of that death was imminent for him, uh, he gathered the most, quote, illustrious men from the whole Jewish nation that he would take basically the stars out of every town, like the people everybody loved, the people who are well-known, and he wanted them to be imprisoned uh, in the arena in the center of the city so that at the moment of his death, all of these men should be killed so that he would know that people would be crying on the day of his death, even if the tears weren't for him. But other than that, he was a pretty good guy. <laughs> Now, in the ancient world, now certainly we remember him for his, his, his craziness, for his ruthlessness, but brutality was actually fairly standard in the ancient world. Um, Herod was not just known for his brutality in that time, but also for his greatness. And uh, there's three primary things that we associate with his greatness as historians talk about Herod. That is his power, his money, and his fame. Now, I've spent a little bit of time uh, in, uh, th in three areas, in D.C. and in New York and in uh, L.A., in those areas. And I think each of those major American cities actually have their own personality. That is, they have their core pursuit. They have their core motivating factor. And I believe that in D.C., ultimately, and of course, there's a blend, but in D.C., it's power. In New York, it's money. And in L.A., it's fame. Herod had it all. Right, so first of all, his, his power. Now, Herod was only part Jewish, and so he rose to power by making friends with the Romans, uh, the enemies of the Jews. In 37 BC, he leads a Roman army of uh, 30,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and he conquers Jerusalem for Rome. And so he takes many of the Jewish uh, leaders prisoner. He hands them over to the Romans. Many of them are promptly executed. Herod, again, famously uh, takes 46 members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was like the Jewish Supreme Court, and he executes them. Herod was a master at straddling allegiance between Rome and the Jewish people. And so he, first of all, he's an asset to Rome. The, the Roman Empire, of course, was always looking out for local governors who could rule their empire and keep people in check. Uh, Herod was the perfect candidate because he was married into a Jewish family, and so that he, could, he could lead the Jewish people while also remaining completely faithful to Rome. But he's not just an asset to Rome, he's also an, an asset to the Jewish people because he's creating jobs. He's exporting their goods, he's building their society back up. But don't be deceived for a moment, his ultimate loyalty is to himself. What about his money? Well, it's estimated that he was one of the richest people to have ever lived. Now, he was born into wealth, but he made money of his own as well. Uh, how? Well, he was actually an early investor in Google. Uh, <laughs> very early. Uh, no, he controlled major trade routes in that time. He mined copper. He was one of the greatest exporters of balsam, which was very valuable. He was also a land baron. In addition to that, of course, he taxed the people heavily. And so money was flowing into his coffers. This would have been something to behold. But he was also really, really well known. And how did he get his fame? He got his fame by building stuff. He was one of the greatest builders in the ancient world. Herod wanted to be great. And he thought that building great things would make him great. And so in that time, he was right. Architecture is in that time in the ancient world how you showed, how you showed that you were someone, that you had made it. And so he builds entire new cities from scratch. He builds palaces, fortresses, athletic stadiums, amphitheaters. He was a pioneer in new building methods and materials. Whatever he did, he did it big. And so just to, to point out a few examples here, um, in one place on the coast to impress Caesar, uh, he builds a new city from scratch called, get this, Caesarea Maritima. And he, he builds an entirely new master planned city there in a place that otherwise was an uninhabited wasteland, basically a swamp. Uh, and so he not only builds it, but as the ancient historian says, here Herod displayed as nowhere else the innate grandeur of his character, of his persona. And so this was a seaside resort in a place where nothing should have existed. The streets followed a grid pattern like in Rome. There was an underground sea-flushed sewer system. The closest freshwater sources were about 19 miles away, and so he creates precise aqueducts from the mountains to the city. 
Now, to take it even further, he didn't really like salt water, even though he was next to the sea, and so he builds a freshwater pool uh, that sticks out into the sea. But the most impressive thing he made was this uh, man-made harbor, which was the largest in the ancient world, larger even than the great uh, harbor of, of Athens. And so he imports hundreds of thousands of tons of concrete and stone from Italy to do it. And all that work, and he doesn't even like the first version, and so he commands, uh, historians tell us, to, to put the whole thing, uh, put marble over the top of the whole thing. Everything he did was the grandest scale possible. We think about uh, at Masada, his fortress that doubled as a luxury compound, right? In a place where there should have been nothing. On the side of cliffs, he has his people create sophisticated water collection system that allows it to sustain thousands of people in a place where there was no rain. Um, they created pressure systems to force the water upward and so it had pools and baths and it had a hot tub, a cold tub, and something called a tepidarium, which was a tepid tub. So if you thought you were happy with your hot tub, you haven't lived until you've had a tepid tub. But think about this. Think about the engineering. Think about the skill. Think about the work required to pull this off. This is over 2,000 years ago. And then we go to Jerusalem, and Herod figured, you know, King Solomon had a temple, and so I'm going to restore this temple. Like, mine's going to be better than King Solomon's. I'm going to be a better king than King Solomon. And so this is the culmination of his life's work. 18,000 construction workers over the course of 40 years. He resurfaces the whole thing in this beautiful white stone. One historian said uh, that the temple was covered all over with plates of gold. And at the first rising of the sun, uh, reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away to strangers at a distance that appeared like a mountain covered with snow. He built huge retaining walls around it. Sections of the wall are still there today. For example, the Western Wall, famously. Enormous stones fit together without mortar. The largest ones there, over 40 feet long, 16 feet wide, nearly 400 tons, we struggle to move them with today's equipment. Even Jesus' disciples are impressed by this guy. This is what we hear his disciples say in, the, in Mark 13. Look, this is speak, looking at Herod's, uh, again, uh, reconstitution of the temple. Look what, look what they say. Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. But I want to look at one more, and that is his favorite house, which was the, called the Herodium. Interesting you know, theme in these building names. Built three miles south of Bethlehem. It was on a hill, but they built the hill up, so it kind of ended up looking more like almost like a volcano in the end. It could be seen from miles and miles away. Uh, it's said that as the sun rose or set, there was literally a, ca a, a shadow that would be cast across the surrounding towns. It was the third largest palace in the ancient world. The buildings alone covered about 45 acres, and the, the manicured lush gardens were about 200 acres on the, uh, the palace grounds. And so what does all of this do for you? It makes a name for you. He was famous. It, uh, we even uh, have record of this, that at one point he bails out the Olympic Games. In 14 BC, the, the citizens of Olympia, Greece, were worried about paying for the next Olympic Games. That was taking a toll on the city's finances. And so King Herod of Judea hears about this, and he was kind of uh, tired of his projects. The temple was nearing completion. Caesarea was basically done. And so he, he needs a new project. He decides to bankroll the Olympic Games of 12 BC. He travels over there. He mingles with the elites. He's hanging out with people. He shows off a little bit. And he likes his experience so much there and the acclaim and the praise that he's getting that he decides to endow Olymp the, uh, the future Olympic Games as well. He even has his name recorded as, quote, the perpetual president of the Olympic Games. Herod the Great. This guy was something. If you're talking about a king, this guy's a king. If you're looking for power, this guy's got power. Want a kingdom? This guy's got a kingdom. And so what do we do with all this? I wanted to share that level of detail about Herod 
because it is a striking backdrop for the birth of Jesus. Jesus entering this world is wild. Uh, For an early listener, hearing of a new king entering Herod's kingdom, that was shocking news. That was subversive. That would have been a, hey, we should probably listen up now, part of the story for them. Jesus' birth, what it ultimately does is it brings about a seismic collision between two kingdoms, between two visions of life, between two ways of being human. And the way of the first kingdom is summed up, I think, very well by uh, the writer uh, and the the Catholic priest, uh, no longer with us, Henry Nouwen, who pointed out uh, from his belief there were three fundamental lies of our identity. And the first is this, I am what I do. And so uh, you're as good as your last performance. You're as good as your last uh, achievement. And so if you win, you're a winner. And if you lose, you are a loser, plain and simple. So I am what I do. And then he said, I am what I have. And so some of us believe, I am my education, I am my stuff, I am my relationships, I am my social status, I am my looks, I am my health. And if any of what I have is lost or if any of what I have cannot be achieved any longer, then who I am as a person comes into question, right? My very sense of self is threatened. And then finally, I am what other people say about me. And so if they're saying good things about me, I feel really good. But if they're saying bad things, then I enter a dark place and my very sense of worth is compromised. And so these are the names, these are the labels, these are the descriptions that are given to us and they can puff us up with pride or they can deflate us in a moment. These were the lies of Rome. These were the lies that Herod was living into, but these are the lies of our time as well. Be great. Be someone, don't be forgotten, build something for yourself. And what is Herod but just the extreme, extreme version of someone who's living a life out of these lies? And what do these lies ultimately do? But they turn us into our own saviors where now I have to control my environment and my reputation and my image just right so I will be safe. And so so Herod, you can see what he's doing here. I, I need people important people to esteem me. Uh, I need palaces. I need to have my name on some more plaques. I need more applause. I need more in my bank account. I need more safety. I need more people who are loyal to me. And those things become for him the ultimate thing in his life, his everything, uh, to the point where um, he wants to be the answer to his own problems to sustain that. And so he's chasing, and he's chasing, and he's running, and he's striving, and he's paranoid that it all might fall down. And the biggest thing about those three lives, about that kingdom, about that way of living, is that it's all very shaky. You actually can't lean on any of those parts. And so if that's how we live our lives, it's that, if that's how we make it through this life, then rest assured that your life will be a roller coaster. As one old saying goes, people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find, once they reach the top, the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. It's ultimately a dead-end kingdom. And it's in that reality, it's in that world that Jesus enters the scene. And he says, you don't have to do this anymore. You really don't. And he introduces us to a new kingdom. Now, when we talk about the new kingdom of Jesus today, that might seem very nice and it might seem very comforting. But it's not comforting if you're the person already sitting on the throne. Jesus isn't good news if you're already the king. In fact, Jesus is a great threat against the empire of self. And so think about what's happening in our, in our text. The wise men, the magi, they come. And they're basically saying to Herod, we're here for something greater than you. That's crushing to Herod. Everything he's built is apparently worthless. The Magi ask Herod in the text, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Born king of the Jews. In other words, where's the real king? Where's the legitimate king? Who are you? And it says that when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. 
And the word troubled is certainly an understatement. <laughs> because another king is really going to mess with things for him. It's going to really interfere with his life, with his position, with his influence, with his legacy. And so Herod's reaction, in a sense, is a picture of what can happen in our hearts. This is part of what Christmas means, that there's a new king. And that's actually really hard news for the human heart. The claims of Jesus as king can trigger very strong reactions in us. It's much easier to accept baby Jesus than King Jesus. Because we have these areas of our lives, I certainly do, that are neatly safeguarded from Jesus that are cordoned off, that are in a different room, a different part of the house. And whether it's our comfort or our spending or our social life, right? Here's a simple test. What teachings of Jesus make you the most agitated? What, what, which ones of his sayings and his teachings and his parables make you the most uncomfortable? Is it something about his teaching on forgiveness? Is it maybe something about our role and our responsibility in caring for the poor and the marginalized? Is it his call to be a servant, to serve? Is it his call to generosity? Is it the guidelines that he gives us around our behavior and our morality as followers of Jesus? The thing that agitates us the most is probably the place of greatest resistance to his authority. It's true in my life. You know, I heard someone uh, point this out recently that whenever Jesus shows up and uh, people have an encounter with Jesus in the New Testament, it always evokes a strong reaction. Either they want to kill him or they want to worship him. But at no point does someone say, wow, Jesus, what an inspiring figure. Now, he might be inspiring, but that's not why he came. He came as a savior and as a king. Herod versus Jesus. You know, we read uh, records of Herod when he was a young man. He was uh, reported to be a good-looking man and a world-class athlete in his younger years. But in Isaiah 53, we read about the coming Messiah. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Herod is among the richest people in human history. But Paul in 2 Corinthians says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ Though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. Herod had many servants. It's estimated that he had up to 500,000 uh, people who worked for his personal care. But Matthew, in Matthew 20, uh, we read, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Herod had extreme political and military power. Jesus said, my kingdom, in, in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. Herod killed, killed thousands who stood in his way. He trampled even those closest to him. But in Philippians, we read, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, I came across this painting uh, this week. It's a little bit blurry. But it's a picture of, of Bethlehem. And in the forefront, there's kind of a, like a cave or a manger scene. It's just this very, very humble, um, very, very nice, uh, humble picture. And uh, even in the text, Luke reminds us of that ancient prophecy from, Mike, from Micah. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For fr from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And so it's a scene of Bethlehem. It's a scene of humility. It's a scene of something that's very small and almost underwhelming. But notice the background, the top right corner. What is that? That's the Herodium. You can imagine Herod pacing the halls, surveying his kingdom, contemplating his next move, his next big project, now, if you were in the ancient world uh, equivalent of a Las Vegas um, odds maker in the first century, and you had to look at this canvas, and you had to pick a winner here, which one should we attach our lives to? Which one, which kingdom should I attach my hope to? Where should I go for comfort, for a future? Well, you look at what Herod's done, you'd say, well, that's a leader. That's power, that's money, that's 
a king. And who's even behind Herod? Rome. Rome is called the eternal city. It will never die. And so you'd look at Herod, and then you'd look over at Jesus, and then you'd look back at Herod, and you'd say, yeah, I'm probably going to go with this guy. Except you'd be completely wrong. You know, a little over 10 years ago, about 12 years ago now, they found Herod's tomb. Today, nobody knows any of this stuff about Herod. His monuments are mainly rubble. Tourists now pay a few dollars to go and stand on some old rocks that were once his crowning achievements. Yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, in a library, singing songs of worship about Jesus. You know, I did a little research this week, and there are still no churches dedicated to Herod today. Yeah. At best, he's got a department store in London. <laughs> and it's not even named after him. You know, we, we've been talking about the kingship of Jesus throughout this series about how good he is, about how different he is, that Jesus came to make a way into abundance and into fullness of life, not to control us, but to liberate us. There's no other king who can do that. There's no other life strategy that will do that. Christmas is saying you don't have to be your own savior anymore. You don't have to be your own king anymore. It's saying you are not just what you do, you are not just what you have. You are not just what others say about you. Christmas is this invitation to serve and to follow a king who is actually great and has our best interest at heart. This is a king who stoops down low to be with us, but he does that to pick us back up. Jesus is the true king we're longing for. We can trust him. We can trust in his kingdom. In the words of Isaiah for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak to us now. Lord, some of us are so desperate for uh, a new way of living, for a new king. Yet for some of us, we look at that, that painting and we see how small and how humble and almost how unlikely it looks for that to work. And so for any of us today who are in a place of questioning or in a place of doubt or a place of uncertainty, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us in a very personal way that your way works. Lord, for those of us who, who purely just need comfort today, that life is hard, maybe it's been a hard season, Lord, we know that you are a really a good king, the best king we could ever hope for. You don't seek to extract things from us, but you want to impart things to us. So we open our lives to you wherever we are, whatever our starting point. Lord, we believe that you have more for us we are thankful for, your, for who you are, for your character, for your good kingship in our lives. Help us to align our story with your story. Do, so, do a new work in us. Do a fresh work in us as we come to the end of this year. Lord, we don't want to be the same as we were. We're longing for trans, transformation. We're longing for new life, for hope. And we trust in your ability to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.